So this is the brand new Garmin Phoenix 7 Pro. That's right, they've now added a Pro model to the Phoenix 7 lineup. So what does that Pro actually mean? Well, the Phoenix 7 Pro has a brand new next generation heart rate sensor, which is supposed to deliver even higher accuracy. They've also upgraded the memory and pixel display with something that's a lot brighter and has a lot more contrast. There's also new training feedback with new hill score and endurance score metrics. There's new shaded relief map overlays. And get this, there's also weather map overlays for stuff like rain, cloud cover, and wind. But there's even more. So Garmin's always had three different sizes of the Phoenix lineup going all the way back to the Phoenix 5. But with each release, there was always just one feature that was reserved just for the largest X size models, the latest being the very useful dedicated LED flashlight that was only available on the Phoenix 7X. But with all three sizes of the Phoenix 7 Pros, all of them get the dedicated LED flashlight and an improved flashlight at that. Now, the Phoenix 7 Pro isn't the only new watch that Garmin's launching today. So they also have their new Epix Pro lineup with many of the same features that are being introduced on the Phoenix 7 Pro. So once you're done for here, go ahead and check out my full video on everything they need to know about the Epix Pro. And if you're curious about the differences between the Phoenix 7 Pro and the Epix Pro, don't worry, I got you covered there as well with a full comparison video, and I'll have both of those videos linked down in the description below. So in this video, we'll be going over all the new software features like the new map overlays. I'll be going into a lot of detail with the new endurance score and hill score training feedback features, all the little tweaks and additions to the user interface. And we'll talk about the flashlight and how that's changed from the Phoenix 7X. And of course, we'll talk about the real world sports performance in regards to GPS accuracy with a big focus, of course, on heart rate accuracy with that brand new fifth generation heart rate sensor. But I also wanted to talk about if you're someone who's now considering getting into the Phoenix lineup, which one you should get, the original Phoenix 7 or the Pro model, because the originals actually have been discounted quite a bit. But I also wanted to talk about if you already own a Phoenix 7, whether the Pro is worth the upgrade. All right, so with all that, let's get into everything new with the new Phoenix 7 Pro lineup. So first up, just like the original Phoenix 7s, there's three sizes to choose from. The Phoenix 7S Pro at 42 millimeters, the Phoenix 7 Pro at 47 millimeters, and the largest Phoenix 7X Pro at 51 millimeters. And the dimensions of weight are basically exactly the same as the original Phoenix 7, so there's really no difference there. And the one in particular that I've been testing is the 47 millimeter Phoenix 7 Pro, and this is how it looks on my 185 millimeter circumference wrist. And I don't have the 42 millimeter or the 51 millimeter Phoenix 7 Pros on me, but this is how the original Phoenix 7S looks on my wrist. And then this is how the 51 millimeter Phoenix 7X looks. Just like before, there's both stainless steel models with a Gorilla Glass lens, and there's also titanium models with a sapphire lens. They do have just one 42 millimeter version that has a stainless steel bezel with a sapphire lens, but the reason they have that option is just because they wanted a particular finish on that bezel. And with the original Phoenix 7 series, there was a difference when it came to the satellite chipset as well as the internal storage between the stainless steel models versus the titanium models. But with the Phoenix 7 Pros, there's no difference here where all of them get the multi-band satellite chipset and all of them do also get 32 gigabytes of storage. And then all of them have solar charging. Now, what's kind of interesting though, is that they aren't increasing the price of these new Pro models. They're actually the same price as the original Phoenix 7s when they first came out. So the 47 and 42 millimeter stainless steel models run 799 the 47 and 42 millimeter titanium sapphire models run 899 and then the largest phoenix 7x are 899 for the stainless steel models and 999 for the sapphire titanium models and for the hardware the first big thing that they upgraded is the memory and pixel display with this next generation display that has a much brighter backlight than before and it also has much more contrast and the colors just pop a lot more too now, what's nice about this new display too is that it's supposed to be more power efficient. So you're getting a display that gets a lot brighter without really taking a hit on battery life. Another nice thing about this new brighter display is in regards to sapphire lenses. So sapphire lenses are awesome for their scratch resistance, but one drawback to those is that they aren't quite as clear as Gorilla Glass. And this was kind of noticeable with the original Phoenix 7s. It's not like it made a huge real world difference, but it was noticeable in some situations. But this new display kind of solves that issue because it's just so much brighter than before. Another trick with this new display display is that the Phoenix 7 Pros now have an auto brightness feature where it's designed to adjust brightness based on your lighting conditions. And get this, they actually use the solar panel as the light sensor itself to make those adjustments. That's kind of neat. What I found though is that even with the highest brightness setting when you're using the auto brightness feature, the display can seem a bit dim in some scenarios. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not so good. And I think there's probably some tweaks that could be done to make the auto brightness feature adapt a little bit better. So if you're finding it to be not as bright as you need it to be, I'd suggest just go ahead and turning that setting off and then using the manual brightness setting like before where you can really see the full glory of that new display. Oh, and really quick, if you're finding the information in this video to be useful, do me a favor and just quickly hit that like button down below. It's a small thing that you can do to help this video 
video and the channel quite a bit, and I appreciate it. And then another big upgrade with the Phoenix 7 Pros is a brand new fifth generation heart rate sensor. And the biggest change you'll notice is that the surface area is much larger than before with three times the amount of LEDs. And this allows for a much larger area where it can take samples. But along with that, the sensor itself also sits just a hair taller than the previous generation. So it sits deeper into your skin for better contact, but it's actually not noticeable when you're wearing it. And in addition, there's also these metallic contact points that surround the entire sensor. And then it basically looks like during just normal everyday use, it uses the two middle sensors and then during workouts, it fires up the outer LEDs for higher accuracy in those scenarios. And the previous generation Elevate heart rate sensor was a pretty good sensor, but it could sometimes struggle with some activities that pose challenges for wrist-based optical heart rate sensors like mountain biking, weight training, as well as high intensity interval training. And that's a big goal with this new sensor is to deliver higher accuracy with those kind of activities. And don't worry, we'll be diving really deep into how it actually performs here in just one bit. Another new feature, at least for the 47 and the 42 millimeter Phoenix 7 Pros is that they've now added the dedicated LED flashlight that was first introduced with the Phoenix 7X. And I gotta tell you folks that this is easily one of my favorite features that's come out on watch in a long time. In fact, it's the reason that I've used the Phoenix 7X as well as the Enduro 2, even though I tend to prefer a smaller watch. It's really that good, but now all three sizes have the flashlight. Now, when Garmin first introduced the flashlight with the Phoenix 7X, they actually kind of wanted to make it subtle and blend in with the case. So the lens is actually a little cloudy or tinted, I guess you would say. And with the Enduro 2, that has the flashlight as well, but they weren't as concerned with hiding it on that model. So you'll notice that the lens is clear and thus the flashlight is actually brighter on the Enduro 2 versus the Phoenix 7X. And that's what they've done now too with the Phoenix 7 Pros is that they just chose to use a clear lens rather than hide it. So it's a slightly brighter flashlight than what was found on the original Phoenix 7X. But they've also changed the LED configuration around slightly where the LEDs are now closer together. And I'd have to guess that the reason for this is that it fits easier into the smaller case sizes. But with the largest Phoenix 7X, it actually has a wider lens, which allows for a wider beam. And then just like before, you can quickly access the flashlight with a quick double press of the upper left-hand button. And there's also settings here where you can adjust the brightness. And then you can also shift it into a red color for use at night, which is supposed to be easier on the eyes. And this next portion of the video has some flashing lights. So if any of you out there are sensitive to those, just go ahead and fast forward by about 15 seconds or so. But there's also different strobe patterns that you can use like a blitz mode, a beacon mode, a pulse mode, a blink mode, and a custom mode. And you can even utilize the strobe feature during running activities where you can set it to match your cadence. So this is especially useful for all those late night or early morning runs just for increased awareness. They're also introducing some new bands with the Phoenix 7 Pro lineup. So first off, they have these little notches now on all the bands, which are designed to help them conform around the wrist a little bit better. But they also have these new two-tone bands that come on some of the models. And they also have expanded the aftermarket band options with some of those two-tone designs. And when it comes to battery life, the Phoenix 7 Pro is basically the same as the original Phoenix 7. So you're still getting that great battery life that comes with memory and pixel or transplective display technology. But for a real world example for recording outdoor activities, on this hike, I was using these stock settings straight out of the box using the auto brightness setting for the display. I was using wrist-based heart rate and I had it locked into the multi-band satellite system mode. And another note is that it was a pretty sunny day and also a very pretty day at that. <laughs> and it was right in line with their battery claim, if not exceeding it just slightly. And then one more thing in regards to battery life is that the Phoenix 7 Pros come with a USB-C charging cable now versus the USB type A that was found before with the other end being a standard Garmin charging port. And then on the software side of things, there's now new shaded relief overlays on the map page. And these help add a lot of context to the map page by showing you which areas may be steeper than others. Contour lines are already super helpful, but it may not be obvious at a quick glance which areas may have steep terrain. And this shaded relief overlay just helps you visualize your terrain a bit easier. But if you don't wanna have these shaded relief overlays on your map, page, you still do have the option to disable them if you like, and just use contour lines, but I did find them to be incredibly useful. And then another new feature with the map page are new layouts. So you still have your layout options where you can have a completely clean map page if you like, and you can also have it with one or two different data field overlays. But now there's this new split screen layout where you can have three different data fields on the left with a map page on the right. And then there's also this other quite neat layout they have called a perimeter layout where you can have up to six data fields that surround the outside of the map. And this is definitely a cool layout for all of us data freaks out there who want plenty of data, but also want to view the map at the same time. And yet another map related feature, and this is a pretty cool one, folks, are new weather map overlays for stuff like precipitation, cloud cover, temperature, as well as wind. So what happens here is that in the weather widget, if you press the upper right hand button, you now have these options to display different overlays. So if there's rain around your area, those will display just like so. And then the same thing goes for cloud cover. And then with temperature, it indicates temperatures with different colors, and it also shows the actual temperature in those areas. And with wind, it also shows arrows with the wind direction. I do think that the labels though could be a bit larger with 
both temperature as well as wind. And another thing I'd like to see is the information scale down a bit more at narrower zoom level. So like if you zoom in closer than a five mile zoom range, you may not actually see the label. So it'd be cool if they just kind of scaled down. Now with both these shaded relief overlays as well as the weather map overlays, this will be a big difference between the Epix Pros and the Phoenix 7 Pros just because the displays in the Phoenix 7 Pros don't have as much resolution. So if you're curious about how these differ, go ahead and check out my Phoenix 7 Pro versus my Epix Pro comparison video for all those details. But there is one important thing to note though about these weather map overlays is that they're currently only available through the weather widget. These aren't available on the map page during an activity. And I did mention this is a Garmin and I think they realize it could be better, but one reason for this is that there's a lot of information that has to be pulled down and drawn on top of map that can constantly change orientation. So it's likely really taxing in terms of processing power. So I think there's just some limitations with this feature at the moment. However, that does lead us straight into the next feature, which you'll actually need during an activity to access those weather map overlays. And that's a new recent menu function when you long press the lower right hand button. So before, when you long press the lower right hand button, the default behavior was it would go back to the watch face and then you can scroll through to access all your widgets. But now it brings up the most recent apps or widgets that you've accessed. And I found this to be incredibly convenient, especially since it really is your most recent apps in order of which one you just used. You can still set the hotkey function though for the lower right hand button to go back to the watch face if you'd like. And additionally, you could set up any other hotkey combination to access your recent apps if you'd like too. On the training and performance feedback side of things, they're now introducing a new endurance score metric. And this is all about your ability to sustain efforts over longer periods of time. So we already do have data points like VO2 max and training load, which are very useful, but they're also kind of specific. And with endurance score, it's kind of weaving all those together along with your training history to assess your performance with longer activities. Now, what's great about this feature though, is that endurance score can work for any type of athlete. So with VO2 max right now, that's really more beneficial for runners as well as cyclists where you can collect those metrics. But with endurance score, this works for anyone as long as you're recording heart rate. So that's whether you're doing skiing, hiking, kayaking, weight training, rock climbing, basically anything where VO2 max or training load may not be as useful. And as you can imagine, doing longer activities definitely can make a big impact on your score. But what's interesting though, is that you don't necessarily need to go out and do like a seven hour bike ride or anything like that. You can actually still maintain your score with more consistent training at higher loads. So for example, on a particular week, it gave me a score of 92.52 with with a total training time of 12 hours and 39 minutes with my training load at 889. However, then on another week, it gave me a score of 9,085, but my training time was much lower at seven hours and 39 minutes, but my training load was much higher at 1333. So that's where you can definitely see where those longer training sessions absolutely will bump up your score higher, but you still can maintain with consistent training. And another thing to note is that your performance does play a factor in this. So what I noticed on a rather long hike I did was that my score actually went down, but the reason for this is that I felt kind of like garbage that day and my performance wasn't all that great. So it's not like just doing super long activities will bump that score higher. It's really about your ability to sustain longer efforts. And by the way, there's really no theoretical limit to the score either, other than human potential, of course. Course, but as kind of a gauge, I guess an elite level triathlete may hover around that 11 to 12,000 range. Now, if you're a first time Garmin user, it'll take a couple weeks to build a baseline. So you'll need to use your watch for a few weeks to get this feedback. But if you're an existing Garmin user, it'll utilize the last 28 days of your training for your score and a little populate more over time. The other training feedback that they're introducing today with the Phoenix 7 is a hill score metric. And this is pretty straightforward where it's assessing your ability to climb during running, trail running or hiking, but it's not really intended for cycling. So what you get with this is an overall hill score on a scale of zero to 100 with a classification based on your score from anything from recreational to elite. And then you can dive into the score to see more specifics about your hill endurance, which is more about your longer term aerobic ability, as well as your hill strength, which is more about your high aerobic or anaerobic efforts. So think like stuff like hill repeats or really steep terrain. And hill score really is all about climbing. It's not factoring descending into the equation and it's actually not utilizing running power either. It's more about the combination of time that you spend climbing, the grade, the total elevation gain, as well as intensity or exertion. And for an example of how all this works, here's where I started out with a hill score of 41 with a hill endurance score of 12 and a hill strength score of 27. And after a three and a half mile hike with 1,790 feet of elevation gain, it bumped me to a 45 with a hill endurance score of 18 and a hill strength score of 32. And you won't be able to see your hill score or endurance score update in real time, by the way, during an activity. So it's not like you can go back to these widgets and see this score go up during an activity. These will actually update after you save your activity. And then the Phoenix 7 Pros also come with a huge list of sport profiles, just like was found on the original Phoenix 7. So all the common stuff like running and cycling, there's pool swimming and open water swimming, 
triathlon, plenty of gym profiles, lots of outdoor recreational profiles, as well as boating profiles, hunting and fishing, and there's also tactical and jump master profiles amongst many others. But they're now adding 30 plus new profiles with the launch of the Phoenix 7 Pros with a big emphasis on team sports. There's contact sports like boxing and MMA, as well as quite a few racket sport profiles. Oh, and then one more thing to note about all these software features is that these all will be getting backported to the original Phoenix 7s via the software update. And then when it comes to GPS accuracy, like I was mentioning earlier, all of these come with a multi-band satellite chipset and they also come with their auto select or sat IQ mode where it's able to automatically switch between different satellite modes based on the quality of the satellite signal. So like if you're out in the wide open where you have a clear view of the sky, it'll likely use a lower power mode. But if you're under some really heavy tree cover or around some really tall buildings where getting a satellite signal is a little bit tougher, that's where it may switch to a higher accuracy mode. And in regards to accuracy, the Phoenix 7 Pros are just like the original Phoenix 7s where they're very accurate. I think at this point in time, Garmin is absolutely one of the leaders when it comes to accuracy. And I had no issues at all with the dozens of activities that I did with it. And I should also mention that the Phoenix 7 Pro did great with elevation gain as well. And then the same thing goes for the finer detail, the GPS tracks, they're totally rock solid and that's for activities out in the wide open. Tracks on tight corners and switchbacks are nice and crispy. And it also did really well under heavy tree cover. And I think at this point, Garmin has things pretty dialed in the satellite accuracy department. Now for heart rate accuracy, this part gets kind of interesting considering the Phoenix 7 Pros come with their new fifth generation heart rate sensor, which is designed to be much more accurate than the previous generation. So let's see how it actually performed. So on this indoor ride that had some intervals as well as some steady state sections, well, first off right here at the beginning, that's actually the chest heart rate strap that I was using that may have been dry or something like that, which is why it looks a little bit wonky. So we can kind of just ignore that. But the Phoenix 7 Pro was right in line with the optical arm heart rate sensor I was using as well as the other watch I was wearing. And then for the rest of the workout, great stuff stuff out of the Phoenix 7 Pro. Very responsive and very solid. And then for running, this was actually a trail run, so actually a little bit more challenging than a road run since there can be more impact from the rougher terrain, but the Phoenix 7 Pro did very well here. There was this moment right here where it dropped by just a few beats per minute, but other than that, it was really solid. Now, moving on to something even harder, let's take it outside for some road biking. And this is where there's more challenges for a wrist-based optical heart rate sensor to deal with like gripping onto the handlebars as well as bumps and vibrations from the road. And the Phoenix 7 Pro handled this really well. So at the beginning, there was a little bit of a delay to pick up the rise in heart rate, but that can happen with wrist-based optical heart rate sensors. But after that, things were solid. There was this moment right here where it didn't quite track the fall in heart rate initially, but then it got back in shape. A little blip here and a little blip there, but overall quite good. And then taking it up a notch, now we've got some mountain biking to deal with, and this along with weight training are basically the hardest activities for wrist-based optical heart rate sensors to track accurately. So first off, there's constant gripping onto the handlebars with flexes your wrist, and then you add in all the rough terrain that can make a watch bounce around in your wrist, no matter how tight you have it. And this is where we start to see more hiccups. Now, if we take a look at the elevation graph below, what you can see is that for the first portion of the ride where I was climbing, the Phoenix 7 Pro did really well. But once I started to descend, that's where it's not quite as accurate. But what you'll notice though, is that it recovers well and picks up back on my heart rate pretty quickly. And then for weight training, this is kind of the pot of the gold at the end of the rainbow for a wrist-based optical heart rate sensor in terms of accuracy. And it's not spot on as you can see though, where there's a spot like right here and here during these shoulder flies where it tracked low. And then over here at the end of the workout, this portion right here is using some battle ropes, which is probably one of the worst kinds of activities for this kind of sensor to track accurately. And we definitely see some dropouts here, but it did handle these other intervals at the end very well. So overall, the Phoenix 7 Pro is a nice upgrade from the original Phoenix 7. Could they have called it a Phoenix 8? Maybe, I mean, it does come with that next generation heart rate sensor and has that massively updated display and you get a flashlight in all three sizes. And this really does round out the Phoenix lineup quite a bit. And now there's really no difference other than battery life between all the sizes, so anyone can benefit from all the features regardless of wrist size. Now, what's interesting though, is that the original Phoenix 7s, these have been on some massive sales recently, and I'd anticipate that the prices are largely probably gonna remain the same now that the Phoenix 7 Pro is out. And while the Phoenix 7 Pro does come with some very nice upgrades, the original Phoenix 7s at more than like $200 off right now, that's a smoking deal considering you're getting a super capable sports watch that can track any activity that you'd like, a super premium and durable build, full mapping capabilities, a solar charging option, a sapphire lens option, and to top it all off, you're getting all those new software features via a software update. I'd say that the new Phoenix 7 Pros may be worth it if you prefer a smaller 47 or 42 millimeter versions, but you really want that flashlight. The heart rate sensor on the original Phoenix 7 is a good heart rate sensor. It's not quite as good as the new one, but if you tend to do more endurance sports or cardio-based activities, or if you like to get more accurate heart rate with an external heart rate strap, that's where you may not benefit from that new sensor. But those are just 
my thoughts, but I also want to hear about what you think. So let us all know your opinion down in the comment section down below. And on your way down there, make sure to hit that like button and also subscribe to the channel for lots more sports tech videos that are coming soon. Oh, and also make sure to check out my full in-depth review of the Epix Pro, as well as my comparison video of these two. Anyhow, thanks so much for watching and we will see you in the next video.